because, um, you know, uh, living in Beirut two hours away from Damascus, you know, and being able to witness firsthand um, the war and how it spilled into Lebanon and um, our Syrian brothers and sisters coming into the country, um, becoming displaced in Lebanon and the whole context, the whole political context, I really wanted to dig deeper and look at how the Arab satellite television channels were portraying um, uh, these, you know, this war and specifically how they were looking at the displaced Syrian communities and women. And what I wanted was not to focus just on, you know, the stereotypical gender, the stereotypical gender representations in the media, but more on the experiences and how the media talked about the experiences, how the Arab television media talked about the experiences and how the sociopolitical agenda of every television channel kind of influenced um, the way they talked about the experiences. Um, looking at the news, um, there were three concepts that always, I mean, mostly reoccurred when talking about the experiences. First was the violence. So obviously there's a war, there are incidents of violence. So when you're exposed to violence, obviously you are vulnerable. You're in a vulnerable state and naturally you, you, you kind of, um, employ your resilience in this situation and also resist the social, like the, 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 the dominant social order you're in. So these are the four concepts. I will explain them more into, in, in detail. Uh, so the agenda, I will look at the context, the Arab television, the aims of the study, the more in detail, the four concepts, the main findings, and then the conclusion. Um, so yeah, so the, the Syrian conflict um, has influenced the gender realities and the gender relations lived by internally and externally displaced Syrian communities. Um, there was regime brutality in detention centers, prisons, and checkpoints. There were other war crimes committed by other militant groups fighting against the regimes, such as sexual violence committed against women. Um, there has been an increase in child marriage cases among the displaced Syrian communities. There has been an increase in female-led households, and this necessarily doesn't always translate to more equal opportunity among men and women. In fact, it just for, like, furthers um, the, the burden of providing for, for one's family. And then uh, the resilience building program. So of course, in every war, there are humanitarian initiatives happening. The UN creates, you know, um, vocational programs or skill building programs to help uh, the, the affected persons cope with, with the war and with living in exile. And then the, another, another reality is the, is, the fact, is the formation of the all-female military force by the Syrian regime. So we saw in the news a lot of female fighters, um, also among the, the Kurdish communities, but also female fighters for fighting for the Syrian regime. Um, and these female fighters were either depicted as victims of sexual and gender-based violence, or on the opposite side as heroines fighting uh, in the arms resistance of Syria. So this, is the, this dichotomy and representation makes an interesting context as well. Um, so given the fact that the Syrian war is also a proxy war. There has been a number of international actors and regional interests in the war. And this led to an intersection of ideologies that, um, that has led to a fanatic discourse and that has impacted uh, you know, the trends of violence against women. If we look at this access, of course, the Syrian conflict, there are multiple fighters, but in this specific study, I just focus on two. The first one is the opposition as in the Free Syrian Army and the other Islamic fighters. And this fighting actor is supported by the Arab Gulf states, such as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the UAE. On the other side, of course, is the Syrian regime, uh, led by Bashar al-Assad and the Ba'ath Party, the Ba'ath political party, which is the party of Bashar al-Assad. And the Syrian regime is supported and, and has allies such as Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah. So this study just focuses on these two sides. Um, obviously, these two fighting actors have 
Arab satellite television channels that speak on their behalf or, or that support them or are critical of them. So when looking at the Arab satellite television during the conflict, we can list uh, a number of television channels that are critical of the Syrian regime, owned by political elites in the Arab Gulf states that are also funding the Syrian opposition. Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, and Al An. Those are the three channels I focus on. And then on the other side, there are the television channels that are owned and controlled by the Syrian regime, such as the three here Sira Al Ikhbariya, Sana, and Sama. And then also, since Russia is an ally, there's Russian TV, Arabic. Uh, okay. So given the fact that in every war, there are humanitarian you know, initiatives happening on the ground, and given the fact that humanitarian workers are witnessing, are always or most likely present in the war zones and in the refugee camps, um, this has made them made the humanitarian workers uh, as a source of information. So they also um, play the role as the reputable expert that the journalists from the Arab satellite television may refer to for um, um, direct information or to know what's happening on the ground. So there's also a humanitarian discourse that has also taken place, that, that is very dominant and has also taken place uh, in the news coverage of the conflict. So aside from the socio-political agendas uh, that every television channel you know, follows, there's also a humanitarian discourse. So the aims of the study, um, as I already mentioned, I focus on the experiences of the displaced Syrian women, and I do not limit the analysis to stereotypical gender roles or whether the news offered realistic depictions or not. The four concepts I focus on are violence, vulnerability, resilience, and resistance, and why it's because the news frequently addressed these concepts or, or talked about the experiences of the displaced Syrian women under those four main concepts. I look at what has been reproduced and perpetuated in the news and what has been left unreported and decontextualized. And I do that by looking deeper at the social, political, and the economic circumstances the displaced Syrian communities inhabit. So, I employ a critical discourse analysis and I specifically look at 32 television news reports aired between January 2012 and September 2018. So when we think about violence, especially in during war or conflict, the first thing that we think about is, you know, physical violence, such as, you know, rape or torture. So, so it's a, a form of bodily harm. In this specific study, I, always shed, I also shed light on a different type of violence um, that usually does not have an identifiable agent. So rape and torture, there's an identifiable agent. The doer of the violent act is, is obvious and is, is usually present when the news talks about it. So in case of rape, the, it's the rapist. In case of torture, let's say, the police, um, but the study also conceives violence through, uh, through the term called objective violence. And this is when um, the doer of the violent act is not always present in the narrative because it's, it's overlooked in the news because the doer of the violent act is, um, is, not, is not very obvious. So when displaced Syrian communities are living in so this, the space Syrian communities in Lebanon are forced to live in tents, in temporary tents, or are forced to destroy their own tents or are do not have access to any source of, um, um, you know, healthcare, et cetera. So living in a state of impoverishment is a type of violence that the study uh, perceives and focuses on and does not limit it to, you know, the, the, the typical physical violence that we see in the news. As for vulnerability, which is a word uh, that comes from uh, the Latin word for wound or vul vulvus, um, this, so vulnerability in general means the state of being open to injury or open to attack and damage. And 
Um, I draw um, my understanding on vulnerability through Judith Butler's uh, understanding, where she says that vulnerability is born in relationship to precarity. And precarity here means uncertainty and insecurity. So when you are living in uncertain um, circumstances or when you are you are you, are, uh, you have an unsecure um, livelihood you are automatically vulnerable and vulnerability is not necessarily the opposite of resistance but in fact it goes hand in hand to it so we cannot recognize um, we cannot resist the, the the difficult circumstances that we're living in without recognizing and without employing all vulnerability um, as for resilience, um, the general term is the ability of an individual to cope uh, in certain situations, to recover in violent situations, and to make daily life be as bearable as possible by um, adjusting the disruptions. So in this study, I will take this basic understanding and then also um, in the following, uh, in the upcoming slides, I will ex explain how resilience acquires a slightly different meaning in a neoliberal society. And as for resistance, I do not perceive, I do not limit, I do not perceive resistance as you know, uh, taking part of an un of the armed resistance in Syria. So if you're a female fighter and you're resisting the opponent, this is not the, the 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 resistance I'm talking about here, but rather the resistance through a form of speech. So when the subject uh, performs a speech act in the news or in their daily life, a speech act that might challenge certain social norms or reinforce certain social norms, uh, this form of speech is a form of, of, of resistance in a way. Resistance to social norms. Okay. So looking at the main findings, the first concept is violence. So when the news talked about the experiences of women in relationship to violence, they mostly focused on how women were exposed to state violence and gender-based violence. The news um, portrayed the female victims that fell as you know, the female victims that were exposed to, say, to, to to state violence as, you know, as destined victims. They kind of normalized the, the violence that happened against women. Um, and this happened through associate, associating the victimhood of these women to sexual difference or to the fact that they are females. So here, uh, the female victim's suffering or the fact that she had fell as as a as a victim as a victim to this violence became naturalized in the news. It not all it became naturalized in the news, but also became fixated uh, to a certain time period. So when the news talked about you know the incidents of rape and torture, um, they only talked about it within the context of. The, the war, they did not really refer or question whether gender-based violence or state violence existed in pre-conflict Syria. So there was no uh, reference to the past and nor there was a reference to the, fu to the future. So we, the, the, the viewer did not see what happened, what happened after the violence has taken place. Rather, the viewer um, was only, so the news only, um, focused on the sexual difference, that the fact that these victims are women. And because they are women, um, the news greatly emphasized on the fact that they were shamed by their societies for falling as victims of violence. And they also emphasized how these victims became victims for their previous imprisonment. So when women were had so when woman was an ex prisoner in Syria, the fact that she was an ex prisoner, you know, in her past life made her not only a victim but also she was stigmatized for this particular lived experience. 
the dominant media frames here is that women that were exposed to violence were seen as a source of shame and they were seen as victims of their previous imprisonment. And these dominant media frames, they kind of came to life. They were produced when the news have, when the news majorly focused on the circulation of shame of the victim and the stigmatization of the victim among her society. Yeah. So I have one question. Yeah. Um, like being uh, a shame for society or mm -hmm. for themselves? Um, that's my question, yeah. Okay. No, it, it was not, um, you didn't go into the detail, but I just wanted to uh, ask if the women felt ashamed themselves or were presented as feeling ashamed themselves or is it the society that is ashamed about? Um, this It's issue? both. Mm -hmm. So the news, as you can see in the photos, the, the women, that they do not um, show their faces. So this is another sign of shame. So we never know we never know their identity. And when the news talked about these incidents of violence, they they most definitely focused on or mostly focused on how these women um, are shamed by their societies for being victims or for being prisoners in the past. Um, so the news was more. Uh, interested in uh, speculating how society treated them as ex-prisoners or as victims of violence, rather than focusing on, you know, how, you know, the state violated the, the human rights and kind of caused this violence. So again, here, the, the news was more interested in the fact that they are women. And because they are women, they have become a source of shame in society and they have been stigmatized. So here there's a focus on, on the gender difference in the news. Now, looking at vulnerability, when talking about the states of vulnerability, the news mostly focused on child brides. And I was a bit surprised in that because you know, child brides are not the only vulnerable or the, the vulnerable uh, demographic group among the displaced Syrian women. Um, they're an, another group that, that was majorly underrepresented in the news are sex workers. So a lot of displaced Syrian women were forced into sex work or had to, you know, become sex workers in order to survive in exile. However, the news was more interested and was most mostly portraying child brides. I actually found only one news report that talked about sex workers. So the most of the news reports looked at child brides. And when talking about child brides, usually the, the mothers are portrayed in the news story and they are portrayed as desperate, as desperate mothers um, that are, you know, sacrificing their daughters in order to lessen the economic burden of the family. Um, so if you look at the photos, the, the identity of the child brides are usually very, very much obvious. Uh, we see a close up of, their fa of, of the child bride's face. We see that she's emotional. We, we see that she's you know, suffering. And we also she see where she's living. So we see that you know, the circumstances she is living in. Um, what the news, what the Arab, what those news reports, uh, so when the news reports represented the child brides, they perceived her marriage or her early marriage as the only way to survive in exile. So the news was not open or did not kind of give space uh, to imagine a different solution to uh, the state of vulnerability to the to the to this to to these economically struggling families so the child bride's desire to lead a different life is portrayed as something unattainable so there there the, 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 the child marriage here was portrayed as the only ultimatum or the only solution for these uh, economically struggling families to survive in exile um, the news aroused sympathy and understanding 
towards the space union community. But this, you know, sentimentalism in the news did not really translate into humanization. In fact, it depoliticized the plight of child brides uh, by only focusing on their suffering. Um, so the fact that the child bride's desire to lead a different life was not recognized in the news. Uh, this automatic, automatically dehumanized the figure of the child bride, regardless of the fact that the news tried to arouse sympathy uh, or not. Um, so this personification did not tra necessarily translate to humanization. Another interesting frame is that there was an absence of men in the news reports. So, you know, male figures uh, in traditional female society are very dominant. You know, they're the, the like, there's, they are sovereign norm setters. Um, um, and the news did not really talk about the father or the uncle or the brother or whether these male figures had a say uh, in uh in the early marriage, rather they were more interested at um, focusing on how the desperate mother is is the one and is the only one willing to sacrifice her daughter. So again, there was also a focus on on the female figure here and ignoring the male figures in the family. So this is for vulnerability. As for resilience, um, the experiences of women were, with resilience were mostly um, portrayed under a humanitarian discourse. And what do I mean by that? Uh, when the news talked about um, displaced Syrian women being resilient while living in exile, the, image, the, the news mostly focused on how they were participating in the programs funded by the humanitarian uh, organizations and these programs are usually you know skill building programs or cash for work programs that you know provide a temporary solution for women to you know live on the bare minimum and provide an income for her and her family as you look at the photos uh, we see the participants in the news um, the news rarely engaged with the participants. The, the attention was mostly on the humanitarian initiatives. Um, there's, there was no contextual background to the conflict. For example, we don't know why these women sought exile, why they are there, how did they get there. Um, the news rather displayed or represented the participants as apolitical, as a group of women who are poor and who are passive and who are there to just participate uh, in the programs. So here, the plight of the displaced Syrian woman is again depoliticized, just like as I discussed in the case of the child bride. However, this time the depolitization did not really happen through, you know, through the news trying to arouse sympathy, but rather through when the news tried to focus more on, you know, the humanitarian initiatives and the advantages they have. So again, they're not really interested um, in the plight of the displaced Syrian woman. So what happens here when, um, when, when there is a very strong focus on the humanitarian initiatives and how those initiatives are helping women uh, become more resilient while in exile. In a context like Lebanon, where there is no welfare state, um, resilience among the displaced Syrian communities is not, does not become just limited to their ability to deal with challenges and obstacles. In fact, resilience here, especially among this demographic group, becomes the only source of security uh, that, that these persons have in exile. So when resilience becomes the only source of security a person has, um, it starts to acquire a kind of a neoliberal meaning in a way that self-resilience here becomes separated from vulnerability. So it's very interesting because I think resilience and vulnerability are pretty much connected. Vulnerable persons are most likely to employ their resilience 
a more, more than a less vulnerable person. But in this case, under a humanitarian discourse that is um, less interested in you know, engaging with the participants and understanding why they are participating in those programs and why they sought exile, this usually, you know, makes their state of vulnerability not so present in the news. Um, this may, this focus on 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 you know on how resilience is how these women are participating in these programs to learn how to become more resilient. This automatically reduces um, the the fullness of, of, of their experience in exile. So we no longer see that they are vulnerable, we just see that they are resilient. And, and, and that becomes problematic because here vulnerability and resilience are no longer connected. And resilience here starts acquiring um, a neoliberal meaning. So what I found is that the women were presented as neoliberal subjects that rely on their resilience as a source of security and the only source of security. And there was strategic silencing. This happened when the news did not engage with the participant. And of course, dehistorization, so lack of history, when we do not know we when the, the viewer does not know why these women are there in the first place. So again poor, passive, apolitical, this media frame is reproduced. And then the last concept, um, resistance. So usually when the news talked about resistance, it was usually from the, the, the television channels that are, own, that are owned by the Syrian regime. Um, so, if you look at the photos here, we have female fighters and we have Syrian women in a public uh, wedding ceremony in Aleppo getting married to uh, the, the male fighters of the regime. So what I found is that these, group, these different groups of women are not mothers in real life, however, they were portrayed under, uh, under the notion of motherhood. So whether these groups of women were mothers in real life or not, they were, they were portrayed through uh, their duty to, to fulfill three national services. So the news talked about their duty to bear children, the duty to transmit and maintain culture and national identity, and the duty to to participate in the armed and unarmed resistance in Syria. So automatically in those news reports, whether you are a mother in real life or not, whether you're, you're on your way to become a mother, you know, engaging in a wedding ceremony, or whether you're just fighting for the motherland or the homeland, as we can see in the photo of the female fighters, these groups, these different groups were portrayed as the mothers of the nation that will fulfill their national service through those three duties. This automatically, so the, this, this um, has produced, um, has put the, the female body under, uh, you know, this notion of nationalization. And what do I mean by that is that um, the body of the Syrian woman in Assad, Syria, no longer remains in the private sphere of the individual, but is also subordinated to national interests. So the role of the women, of the, of the different groups of women here um, are overshadowed um, by their moral duty to, you know, to serve for the betterment of the nation and the people. Um, so given this analysis of how motherhood was portrayed in the news and how it's, you know, um, is being imposed on the, on the female body in Assad, Syria, would it be fair to just limit our analysis of motherhood to just a patriotic duty or a social obligation? Um, I would say no. Um, I would say this is where I kind of give a, you know, a counter argument or 
or kind of look at the those representations from two different perspectives and and say that yes motherhood can be an oppressive and patriarchal uh norm however um we cannot uh neglect how in arab Muslim society, and especially in the context of Syria, how motherhood among many women, especially uh, women from from uh, lower middle class, uh, lower middle social classes, um, they thrive to acquire maternal roles in their daily life because these maternal roles or matriarchal roles provide them with a source of security and dominance. Um, in their domestic spheres. And this is when I just talk briefly about motherhood. So there is a quote by Saba Mahmoud that says, in the 1990s, in response to the call by white middle-class feminists to dismantle uh, the institution of the nuclear family, which they believed to be a key source of women's oppression, Native and African American feminists argued that freedom for them consisted in being able to form families since the long history of slavery, genocide and racism had operated precisely by breaking up their communities and social networks. And I find this quote very interesting because if you look at the Syrian conflict, one of the major aftermath, one of one big aftermath of the Syrian conflict is the fact that many Syrian families were dismantled, were breaking up, broken up because of the war. So from a non-liberal feminist perspective, um, I would say that yes, um, the body of the Syrian woman is, not, is no longer in the private sphere and is being nationalized uh, through the national narratives. However, um, marriage and motherhood in the context of Syria remains an instrument, an, an instrument that kind of transfers control to women. So the Syrian woman's domestic obligations may become a source of power and control in a way. So repressive as they are, the Syrian state's policies that encourage the domestication of women and a society that grants men, for instance, the right to forbid their wives in holding a waged employment and to work in a mix, mixed labor market, which is the context of Syria, makes the role of the mother valued and appreciated among women. So this is just, you know, two different perspectives on how we can look at motherhood in the context of the Syrian conflict. So now that I've presenting, presented my main findings, I will try, I will give the interpretation. So the television channels that are critical of the Syrian regime, that are owned by political elites of the Arab Gulf states that are funding the Syrian opposition, obviously the news here was sensationalist uh, when reporting on the violent crimes committed by the Assad. And at the same time, they kind of ignored the, violent, the violence inflicted on Syrian women by the opposition. On the other hand, the television channels that are owned or controlled by the Syrian regime or supporting it acted as a mouthpiece to the government policies and the political agendas of the regime. They ignored Syrian women living in exile. These news, these television channels just, they think that, you know, women, there are no displaced Syrian communities for them. These communities do not exist and only focused on the positive experiences of women in the war. So given all that, I would argue that there were three logics circulating throughout all of that. There was the media logic, there was the gender logic, and then there was the war logic. When talking about the media logic, mostly it means the militarization of the media or the, you know, using the news reports or the media to kind of justify uh, one's interference in the war. So when the Arab Gulf states um, that are, you know, outspoken about their support of the Syrian opposition that have majorly contributed to this proxy war in Syria by providing weapons to armed groups that are fighting the regime, 
the media logic here becomes quite obvious, uh, especially when those particular news channels um, were mostly interested in revealing how the regime violated human rights um, to show how their enemy, which is the regime, is doing so, but then at the same time, ignoring the violence committed by the groups that they are funding and supporting politically. Um, when they talked about how the enemy or the Syrian regime is violating human rights, uh, they were more focused on how the violation of human rights and the violence inflicted on women um, kind of um, produced this sh shaming, sh uh, shaming and stigmatization of, of the victim. So this kind of reduced the complexity of, of the, the human rights violations uh, when, they, when they mostly focused on how the victims were female and how the victims were shamed and stigmatized. Um, this induced an emotional rather than analytical response. And again, restricted the experiences of female victims to gender binary constructions. And this kind of leads us to the gender logic here that is more, that is focused on how the news constructs the dichotomy of male versus female. So most of the figures, the different, the different uh, figures of Syrian women in the news were placed in the context of traditional femininity. So they were the helpless victims, the female victims that are destined to fall as victims simply because they are female. So here the, the, the suffering and the violence against women is naturalized in the news. Then there are the child brides that are destined uh, to fall as child brides and are portrayed as, you know, their, their desire to lead a different life is um, portrayed as something unattainable or not even in the question. So they don't, they don't even question that. And then the desperate mothers in exile, the mothers of the nation. So women in Syria have to pray the laurel of the mother, whether they are mothers in real life or not. So again, this is traditional femininity. And even the female fighters that what that one would expect to, you know, to be portrayed under muscul a masculine type of um, imagery uh, were actually um, compared to flowers, ornamented flowers. So again, traditional femininity. The last logic here is the war logic. And when we talk about the war logic, it usually means how the news um, Legitimate, gives a, a sort of legitimization of the war by constructing the self and the other. Um, so what do I mean by the self and the other? So when we look at the Arab satellite television channels that are owned by Arab Gulf states, these channels mostly prioritize the humanitarian initiatives over the political meaning of the displaced Syrian communities. So uh, they mostly talked about um, how, you know, um, how the humanitarian initiatives are there to help the Syrian woman, how there is an evil other, which is the regime. So the enemy is the evil other. And again, under the humanitarian discourse, the Syrian women were portrayed as the needy refugee or the poor Arab. So in this case, the Syrian woman becomes portrayed as the other Arab. So the self here is the rich Arab Gulf states and how um, they portrayed the, 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 the displaced Syrian woman as the other Arab that is apolitical, that is passive, and that is participating in the humanitarian initiative in a poor in poor Arab countries such as Lebanon. So this kind of makes creates a divide between the self, the rich Arab Gulf states, and the other, the, the other Arab, the poor Arab uh, displaced in another poor country and participating in the humanitarian initiatives. Um, before this is the last slide. So before I discuss this slide, I would like to mention that. Um, under war logic, when talking about the self and the other, 
Um, when the Arab Gulf states um, portray uh, self-resilience among displaced Syrian women through a humanitarian discourse, um, this does not only create a neoliberal uh, uh, neoliberal definition of resilience, um, but it also has a more um, a social political meaning in a way that, you know, the Arab Gulf states are rich Arab countries that did not offer any uh, resettlement places to the displaced Syrian communities. So they contributed to this, the proxy war in Syria. They provided weapons to the Syrian opposition. They, f they had uh, a direct um, role in causing the displace displacement of the Syrian families. But on the same, at the same time, when looking at the political discourse of the Arab Gulf states, uh, there is an assumption that um, there is no need to 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 assume or to offer responsibility or to offer uh, resettlement places to displaced Syrian communities uh, through the fact that these Arab Gulf states are are pitching in or are paying for those humanitarian initiatives. So when the Syrian women are 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 portrayed as the other Arab who is better fitted to remain in economically struggling Arab countries such as Lebanon and Jordan. This indirectly uh, spares uh, the Arab Gulf states uh, the, from the responsibility of offering asylum to these to these um, to these uh, displaced displaced communities. So, in a way, the humanitarian initiatives or the humanitarian discourse. Are, is there to serve the political agenda of the Arab Gulf states, which is that we're not gonna offer asylum to those groups because they are the other Arab and they are the poor Arab and they are better fitted um, to, stay, to stay in you know, countries like Lebanon and Jordan. So this is the neoliberal discourse that took place hand in hand with the humanitarian discourse in the news. And then on the other side, the, the Assad regime and its allies the the news the the television channels that are um, controlled or that are uh, that are acting as a mouthpiece to, to this to the regime, um, they reproduce the images of Syrian women as the mothers of the nation, and this imagery is part of a greater political agenda that is influenced by the communist imageries of people. So the, the Assad regime and the Ba'ath party, politically, they are anti-Western and they are anti-Arab Gulf states. Um, so when the, the image of the Syrian woman is portrayed through the duties to serve the nation, um, this automatically reproduces the 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 political agenda and the ideology of Ba'ath and Assad, which is to resist Western imperialism and to unite the Syrian people and the Arab Ummah. So again, the figure of the Syrian woman becomes at the forefront of the geopolitical tensions. So there are two ideologies um, that are fighting each other here. First, the Arab Gulf states that are capitalist, they are capitalist societies. Um, they are, you know, anti-Syrian regime, pro-Western and neoliberal. And this, this ideology was reproduced in the news uh, through reproducing the images of displaced Syrian women as the other Arab or the poor Arab. And on the other hand, as I've already explained, the mothers of the nation. Now, these, um, these media frames or the figure of the Syrian woman in this particular context is very contextual. And, you know, in the future, there will probably be maybe be a different regime in Syria. It will maybe no longer be influenced by communist imageries or the Arab Gulf states might shift their political agenda, et cetera. So these images are contextual. They may shift in the future, but they are always, you know, symptoms of broader issues around nationalism, around gender, polit uh, gender uh, politics and conflict. So there will always be symptoms of these factors. And then the last, the last um, slide is, so what can we conclude? Was there a feminist logic in the news? Of course not. Will there be in the future? Most likely not in 
Arab satellite television media funded by Arab Gulf states or the Syrian regime. But the question I would like to ask is, where can refugees, migrants, women, minorities, and any marginalized community gain a political voice rather than be represented as objects of acquiring in the media? Um, so spaces of appearances or spaces where you know, marginalized communities can articulate their voices without being silenced or without having their voices, uh, you know, uh, overshadowed by political agendas and ideologies. So where do the spaces of appearance that challenge hierarchies of representations and empower voices exist? Um, in a study done in Austria uh, on contemporary artistic practices, the study found that um, spaces of appearances or spaces where hierarchies of representations could be undone and voices are enabled do exist and do not exist in the press coverage, for example, but exist in contemporary artistic practices. So this is where the, the counter hegemonic discourse might exist. Also social media contexts where civil society protests and grassroots movements are channeled is another space where, vo where, where, where marginalized communities can, can gain a political voice. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this really in-depth presentation. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so I would ask one thing, uh, which um, maybe you can uh, tell us some more details. Um, could you explain the neoliberal ide ideology in the Arab context a bit more in detail? As I said that in the context of Lebanon, for example, where there's no welfare state, among marginalized communities, um, a person's self-resilience or a person's resilience in everyday life becomes the, the only way to survive. Um, and um, when the news talks about resilience, for example, and how those participants are engaging in the humanitarian programs that, um, that are there to kind of um, help the participants strengthen their resilience. Um, in this context, resilience becomes separated from vulnerability because the news no longer perceives uh, these groups of women as vulnerable, but rather perceives them as people who are, you know, the, the news kind of presents them as those heroic subjects that will recover no matter what. And I think this is very problematic because um, it just depoliticizes um, uh, their plight or, or the fact that, that they, are, they are vulnerable and they are displaced. Um, another example is other from this other, another example on this uh, neoliberal resilience uh, could be seen in, in the explosion in Lebanon. So I don't know if any of you heard the news in August, there was a big explosion in Beirut that destroyed, you know, a huge part of the city. And when the news talked about, you know, how the Lebanese or how anyone living in Beirut is coping, they kind of um, said that, you know, these people will recover no matter what um, because they are resilient. So they will rebuild the country that by themselves, they don't need anyone to help them. Uh, this becomes problematic because um, the news stopped it through, by focusing on how resilient uh, the Lebanese communities are, the, the news forgets that they should question why are these people forced to be this resilient in the first place? Um, why did this explosion happen in the first place? Um, so no one is held accountable. The same for the, the displacement of Syrian, of Syrian, Syrian women. Um, the Arab Gulf states are not held accountable for contributing to the proxy war. The, the Lebanese state is not held accountable for forcing, for forcing uh, displaced Syrian communities to live in temporary uh, tents, to, to destroy their own tents for having these laws that you know, are basically a violation of human rights. So um, again, it's the depolitization 
of the whole situation and the separation of vulnerability from resilience is when resilience starts becoming a new, it starts acquiring a neoliberal um, definition. And I think it's, it becomes harmful in this context because no one is held accountable for the violence or the conflict or, or the injustice that these groups uh, have to deal with every day. What, what came into my mind when you explained, especially the part of the motherhood, was the, um, the similarity to national socialism in Austria and Germany, where also women were um, shown as, as mothers of nation. So I was thinking if it's uh, typical for Syrian people to show women or Arab culture to show women in that way, or if it's um, a patriarchal image that is not uh, attached to any culture at all, but to the system against women. What is the question in that is um, the idea of the imaging women as victims, as um, well, mothers with explicit, explicit roles in war is more a patriarchal culture than any other culture. Yeah. So I don't know if you have observation, made up observations about that because also your uh, observations about the um, neoliberal system and the Syrian system is quite uh, coming to the same conclusion that women are suppressed and um, shown in a weak image. Yeah. Um, so the interesting part is that, yes, um, the Assad regime and the Ba'ath ideology is quite similar to, um, you know, uh, the, I don't know what it was called in Germany, the Dritte Mädels or, or something like that. So so the woman um, living under 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 the Nazi regime and how everything they they had to do in their life was to serve the nation in a way. So yes, it's very similar to that. Actually, some of the sources I I, I used in the dissertation was uh, from this context of uh, Germany and Austria under the the Nazi regime. Um, and. Well, the, when the news talked about uh, the mothers of the nations, they are not they were not portrayed as weak. They were actually portrayed as heroic. Um, that they are, you know, they are heroes. They are the, our only hope to maintain our culture and our ideology. Um, but then again, um, they, even though they were portrayed as heroic, they are were used as objects to. Um, reproduce uh, the state ideology. So there, the individualization of the woman is kind of lost. So the, the, the regime or the, the news produced by the regime does did not really care, does not really care about individualistic issues of women. Uh, these issues are considered as trivial, as unimportant. What they only care about is how they could serve the nation. And yes, I think that this is weak, even though they are um, portrayed as heroic. Thank you. Um, Stanka had also a question. Uh, yeah, thank you for your very interesting talk. Regarding the formation of the female troops, were such troops meant to fight separated from the male troops or were they meant to fight together as mixed troops? Were there any interviews conducted with male troops on their view of the female troops? So in this particular news report that talked about the female, uh, female troops, uh, the speaker of the news report was Asma al-Assad, who is the wife of Bashar al-Assad. So um, it wasn't Bashar al-Assad that was talking about them. They assigned his wife. So it's female on female in this way. Um, the, the Arab satellite television channels that are owned by the Syrian regime did not conduct any did not conduct any interviews with male troops or on their view of female troops. However, the the news reports that are opposing the Syrian regime, such as the Arab Gulf states, um, they talked about how these women were being raped and sexually harassed while serving as as female fighters on the battlefield. So again, um, 
this um, this focus on the male and female dichotomy and again the the Arab satellite television channels wanted to talk about how the enemy is evil etc and yeah so there was a news report on how these female troops were harassed and how they were are, are just used as instruments by the regime to kind of appeal to the West that they are modern and that they have female fighters, et cetera, um, or, or something, something around those lines. Um, there are also female fighters for the Kurdish, um, uh, the Kurdish uh, militias. I do not um, analyze um, those news reports, I do not speak Kurdish, so I couldn't really analyze the, the television channels run by Kurdish uh, uh, po political parties. Um, but the, Kur the, female, the female fighters, uh, the Kurdish female fighters uh, were mostly portrayed um, as also as heroic, uh, but um, And as as if they are, you know, sexually liberated, etc. Um, but obviously, this is not the case. I mean, um, a lot of these uh, female fighters in the Kurdish communities they need their father's approval to join the military. So obviously, also it's it's more complicated than that. So when the West talked about these women being so liberated, etc. That obviously is not the case uh, in reality. So there's all, there's still a male figure um, in the whole situation that is very dominant. I also have one more question. Um, because you were talking like, oh, I wondered if there are maybe, or does there exist anything like a political neutral platform where we, women can speak up? Like, because you told her like these two opposite channels um, for pro Asa regime or like the opposite, but always like reporting about the women's situation from the point of view. But I think it would be like interesting if there's anything where you can like get of also for women or for like the people um, where women speak up and tell their experiences like from their point of view from their like what they experience and not like from something above like mm -hmm. reporting about them yeah so i actually mentioned that in the dissertation and i have already mentioned i think social media is a great platform for that there are a lot of facebook groups and instagram pages that are you know feminists that are arab arab that is basically about Arab feminism. Um, the only problem is that the demographic group that I mostly that are mostly represented in the news reports are from, you know, from very lower lower social class um, um, groups of women who are very much economic struggling economically, and they might not even own a smartphone. So, again, there's the digital divide. So there would there are spaces on social media that um, challenge uh, the hierarchies, uh, but I have my doubts that you know th the child bride that is living in a tent is is the one that is in control of the social media account due to this digital divide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's why we need more engagement uh, in the news. So I think that's the solution. Yeah. Uh, additionally, I would uh, ask, um, what is the role of um, female media producers who are working for newspapers, television, in um, this uh, reporting? And yeah, do they speak up, or are they such uncritical as um, yeah mentioned to you? Um, to be personally, I don't think if you are a woman, then you, then you will automatically bring in a feminist perspective on the situation. For example, um, there was a news report that was talking about the child brides. And the news reporter interviewed a female lawyer in Jordan. And she was asking her about the law uh, of child marriage in Jordan. So before this, the, the Syrian conflict started, the law... And Jordan said that you should be 18 years old in order to get married. 
once the displaced Syrian communities arrived and there was a rise in child marriage cases, cases a lot of uh, girls were getting married illegally. So uh, this lawyer, this female lawyer, was explaining how it's an it, it was an advantage that the government decided to change the legal age from 18 to 15 years old. So they actually changed the age. So now it's legal. If you are 15 years old, you are legally, you can legally get married uh, in Jordan. And I think her, her narrative or her discourse is very patriarchal because she was trying to justify how this law is serving uh, the child brides. Because, you know, when you get married uh, in Islam, you, the man has to provide a, a money to the family so she was kind of justifying it she's like yeah now they can do it legally the family will get money and uh the whole thing is legal etc so i don't know yes we need more women journalists of course but this doesn't your 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 sex does not necessarily i don't think necessarily translate to a feminist discourse so but how is it like um, how many women um, can work as journalists? Is there a high rate or is it rather? I think there, there is a high rate in Lebanon, I think. Mm -hmm. I think so. I don't really have the numbers, but um, in a place like Lebanon, there are a lot of female journalists. Um, in Arab Gulf states, probably not at all, maybe zero. But um, in Lebanon, there is. And... Um, yeah, I mean, in a country like Syria, where there's like this ideology of nation, this national socialist ideology that is based on the idea that men and women are equal, but is also based on the idea that they are equal because they are there to serve the nation in a way. Um, there are a lot of women that have high government positions, but again, they are part of a ideology that oppresses women in a way I think mm. so. that you also mentioned uh, the Arab feminists um, what role do they have do they gain more um, power or is it less yeah I mean I would consider myself an Arab feminist and I think this project kind of brought a perspective of you know a non-liberal type of feminism I think You know, feminism that was born in the U.S. and Europe does not really necessarily translate to feminism in Arab Muslim societies, as we saw in the quote by Sabah Bahmoud. Um, so, yes, I think it's very important that more, you know, women in Arab Muslim societies um, kind of bring their own perspective in academia and uh, in, in the political discourse and talk about what feminism is to them um, and how they define it. And I think it's different in every context, I, I think. And how was it for you in Beirut? Uh, did you get access to this knowledge or was it hard? Well, I think I, <laughs> I mean, since I studied at a, At a, at a well-known university, I think it was very easy to to kind of articulate my 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 opinion in that way. Um, but I mean, I would say I can just speak to to my experience. So yeah, I think I had uh, the platform because of the university. But I mean, if you if you look at Egypt right now, it I really don't know. I think <laughs> I don't think I can answer this question. So. But it was accessible for you yourself and hopefully yes, mostly for because some... of my studies, mm -hmm. mostly because of my studies and because there are NGOs in Lebanon that fight for women's rights and it's totally okay. So there is a law that allows it, but there are other countries in the region that do not allow such thing mm -hmm. like Iran, for example, it's impossible mm -hmm. to have that. Mm -hmm. So this is just a special case to Lebanon. And of course, in Syria, it's not allowed either because every political party or every organization that has to exist should be there to kind of um, support the regime. So you cannot, uh, you know, articulate a different uh, a different opinion or criticize it. Marie, thank you for being here, Marie. I'm really happy you came. Did you think about including documentaries about Syrian women into your analyses? Oh. Yeah, I was thinking about um, 
like the I, I'm sure you know the famous documentary uh, not who we are because it's also portraying the woman and child um, brides and I was just wondering if you can maybe talk about the differences between these documentaries and your findings um, in the media reports. What's the name of the documentary? Not who we Not are. Not who we are. It's... Um, okay, I, I'm sorry, but I was not... Or maybe other documentaries, because I think they might be similar on the topics they are focusing. Okay, and you, was, was I have not seen this documentary. I was just... Um, because this was a documentary and it was also... Um, talking about this topic of child um, brides, but was not at all um, like contextual that, or putting it into context that, um, yeah, in how, how far this is also, ha or this also happened before the war. And you also mentioned like the role of men, this was also not covered at all. So maybe you can just from your experience or knowledge or other studies um, talk about like the context of child brides. For instance, in Lebanon, there are no laws against child marriage. I mean, I think there was a huge movement that wanted to raise the age to 18, but it never happened. Um, so again, when the news reports talked about the, the, the child marriages, they mostly kind of portrayed it as if that, oh yeah, look at those poor displaced Syrian communities look at how they're sacrificing their kids and their daughters in order to cope in exile. And there was no mention to how there are no laws that protect those child brides from this phenomenon. Child marriage existed in pre-conflict Syria, but not to that extent. Mm -hmm. It increased drastically after the conflict. And this tells us that yes, child marriages be became a, a coping mechanism among many families in a way. So it was a way to say that when we give away our daughter, when we sacrifice our daughter as a child bride, there is one less mouth to feed um, in the family. So it's it was a way to lessen the economic burden. And um, I don't think the news um, talks about this through a perspective of injustice. It just talks about it in a way that, oh, it's a misery, it's a tragedy. Look at these girls, they're falling as child brides. Oh, what a sad situation. Um, but they don't really address it as, uh, as a consequence of injustice in society. And I think that was the lack of context that existed um, in the news. And what is the role of men in this decision <laughs> yeah so I mean I was surprised because I mean I mean men m men in Syrian society set the norms in a way and um, the news did not really was not interested in interviewing how the father or the uncle or the older brother uh, was willing to sacrifice uh, th their daughter so there was a total absence of the male figure and they were just more interested in, in portraying how the mother, you know, the mother is there to sacrifice her daughter. So I think it's very problematic that that uh, the male figure is not interviewed because they are, they obviously have a big say in this and not just the mother. And um, I think there's a bias in the news when they're not interested in, in looking at what the father has to say. The mother is kind of the one that is being portrayed. I'm, I'm not gonna say that she's portrayed like as like the, the evil uh, parent that is willing to give away her daughter, but she was definitely portrayed as desperate and uh, as there to willing to sacrifice her daughter. So there is a bias there, I think. In the documentary, do they portray the men, the male figures? Not, not at all. And that's oh. with the documentary, you assume that it is more uh, closer to what is happening. But yeah, it's it's similar to what you read in the news. So, yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you if you have some empirical experiences uh, of uh, how fathers, brothers react uh, when their daughter are married age i mean I, i i don't know it depends on the family i guess how, how they how they react when their when their daughter becomes a child bride you mean mm -hmm. 
I mean, it, it depends on the family. I mean, obviously, if the if the Syrian girl wants to get married at the age of 15, I mean, it's her right. But uh, I think it becomes problematic when this marriage uh, becomes a, a um, you know like a monetary exchange. Um, so when the the girl it becomes sold kind of to the, mm-hmm. to, the, to, the to the to the family uh, in return of money or in return so in the, in the case of in the case of uh, for example Hanifa uh, the the Syrian girl that got married at the age of 15 one of the girls that were showed in the news um, she was she was married to the landlord to the Lebanese mm-hmm. landlord who was 44 years old So her family is renting their one-room apartment from this man, and they no longer were able to pay the rent. So he said, okay, I can marry your daughter, and you can just stay there for free. Um, so again... It's kind um, of flavor, you know. So again, yeah, so again, um, the landlord was not interviewed in the news reports. We don't we don't know who he is. We just know he's 44 years old, and he's going to marry the girl. Um, he's Lebanese. Uh, they are living in Lebanon. There are no laws in Lebanon uh, that prevent this this whole marriage. However, the news does not mention any of that, does not interview the landlord nor any male figure and just focuses on how Hanifa is like crying and how she says that she has to do this uh, or otherwise her family will end up on the street and how her mother says, you know, everyone wants the best for their daughter, but I have no other solution. So again, the bias Um, and the uh, decontextualization in the news. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we will. We are already running over the time, and but Sandrila has uh, one last question, and would also add add one from my side because it's fitting. Uh, what would you advise foreign media interpreting the stories of Syrian Arab women in order to form the right picture? And my question would be, what can we do here for um, ameliorating this situation? I think the whole point of this whole study is to show the importance of engaging uh, with the subject you are representing and not employing one's political agenda into the narrative. So what you can do, what we can do here, whether foreign media or local media is more engagement with the subject um, providing a space for their voice um, and uh, not using the subject uh, as a way to, uh, you know, uh, justify someone's interference in the war or, um, you know, po- portray them as, you know, objects of the Orient, let's say. So, yeah, again, so just in- more engagement uh and more spaces for voice and without silencing or, 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 or framing the narrative for one's own interest. What would be your contribution on the issue within the Arab Springs that challenged the political status of the Arab world, bringing more inclusiveness of human into political sphere? However, the return of fanatism and the role of media on those issues. Do you want to explain it more? Yeah, I would like to, um, I think you did a great job concerning the topic of women in the Arab world, but my question is, what would you say how the revolution has bring more women into political sphere of the world, um, um, of the region precisely? Yeah, I think the the Arab uprisings that happened in the region exposed all the inequalities yes. in society. So women were before the the upbring the uprisings were already you know vulnerable. Were already living in uh, you know in countries that have no laws that protect them or empowers them, etc. I just think those uprisings they gave they gave those inequalities more appearance. They brought them into the, to, to the forefront and they exposed everything. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary.
Yeah, thank you very much also for the link. Um, yeah, so I think we will go. Uh, we will close now the whole session. But thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Great presentation, and I will also take with me um, for future um, work maybe uh, some campaign against child bride in the Near East because it wasn't a topic or wasn't so present in my consciousness until now. Maybe I can find some campaigns. And another thing is like maybe really uh, respond to media um, um, accounts also here in Austria if they um, shed a false a light onto women's role. I think this is maybe something everybody can do somehow. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much once more. And Thank you. I hope it was mostly clear. I mean, it was very long, but I... At some point, it got a bit complicated, but I hope it was mostly clear for us. No, very well structured, I, would, I think, and um, I think for I think most of you have somehow um, uh, pre knowledge to the issue, so I think it was very fine. Okay. I would say. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank good luck for your future, I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for attending and giving this uh, your attention and interest. It really means a lot to me. So. <laughs> Goodbye to everybody. Have a nice evening and bye. Bye. bye.